what took place in between that time after this incident? Um, I submerged into the gang. I experienced a very traumatic experience when I was 13. This one officer, the story goes that he was so obsessed with the gang that I was from that he went to my country to study it, right? Wow. And came here. Yeah, yeah. And he would tell me, I'm going to get you one day. I'm going to get you. So that, that's the one thing that he did tell me when he arrested me. He said, I told you I was going to get you. Yo, welcome back to Rancher Network Podcast. It's your boy, Yak. It's your boy, T. Yo, y'all see him. We got him. Y'all yeah. want to welcome our boy, Juan Gomez, to the podcast. Let's get it, baby. Yo, thank you for being here. Thank you. We appreciate it. Um, I want to give a shout out to, to Jared and uh, Mr. Don from Lake Hope for connecting all of us, nice. man. How do you feel being here? I feel good, excited, excited, ready to um, share my story. You know, one thing yeah, that I yeah. respect is definitely, is, I think we both saw it too, when we talked about you kind of in the pre-screen, man, you're passionate, you're passionate, and I say this all the time for a lot of other guests too, but you too, you're passionate, you've had so many experiences, you're out here, and now you're willing to tell your story, and we appreciate it. Shoot, now we've had the whole, uh, we hold, they call us Monsters cast on here now, huh? Pretty yeah. much. Well, yes. you know, the other one, yeah. it's in the works, we got something for you yeah. guys, it just hasn't came out yet, but it's there. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we'll, we'll kick it off how we usually kick off, right? Just normal conversation, nothing too crazy. Um, but I want to touch on, you know, where you came from. You know, you're you're coming from El Salvador, what that childhood was like, and that come up. So go ahead and let us know uh, what that was like for you. Yeah. So I was um, born and raised over there. I'm from Santa Ana, the state, and um, you know, life was um, life was good <clears throat> in a lot of ways. I feel like um, I had a good family. You know, I had a good uh, um, I, 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 we were not rich or poor, we were just medium. Mm -hmm. But there was definitely a lot of dysfunction growing up. You know, like my father was an alcoholic. Um, he was very abusive towards my mother, myself, my, my brother, right? Wow. So I think that was like a little, um, well, not a little, but like a rough start in my life. And, um, you know, life was um, simple. My, my, my whole family worked in markets, you know, so my life consisted of like, this, the house to the school, the school to the market, the market to the house. You know, that was pretty much life since I was like 10, 11. And you yeah. had both brother and sister in the, in the mix. You had both the dad and mom in the mix as well, right? Mm, for the beginning, I, I'm the second of three siblings. So it's my older brother, myself, and my younger sister from the same dad and mom. And I only had my dad for two years, from four to six. And after mm. that, he migrated here to the United States. Mm and to provide financially for us. Mm -hmm. mm, okay, now, so now he, he, he went out. Mm -hmm. um, you're left alone with your brother. Yeah. Did you feel like there was a role you had to take over during that time when he, I mean, you were still young, but did you feel a role or some kind of pressure to kind of go and help your family and support? Initially, no, at those, at those early years, no. You know, I was a kid, I was running a mug, I was just getting into trouble, like in the market or like, you know, little kid stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Like running around and, 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 and getting, uh, um, getting burned because I'm running around. Like, and I, I, I got burned because I ran into a lady with a boiling pot of coffee so that she's Oh, you literally yeah. got burned? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like running through the market? Like yeah. Like dead on people and yeah. then just you bump into just, somebody? Just doing oh, crazy man. stuff like that. Like movies, know? huh? Yeah. And just like the, the, the classic stuff, like playing with trompos, you know, like mm -hmm. with canicas, you know. Canicas, yeah. man. That was the okay. whole. Canicas being the uh, marbles. Marbles. Oh, yeah. That was yeah. the thing. That was the thing. Here. So yeah. is that area of El Salvador like a city or is it like it's rancho? Would it be equivalent to rancho, it's dirt roads and stuff? City. Ciudad, okay, you big have, city. You have that around you, though. You have the, mm. the rancho around, around you, but it's, I was more raised in the city. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Mm -hmm. how, how different would, it, would it, you say the, the rancho component to the city was, especially in regards to, like, you know, with friends, you know, or anything like that? I think it's pretty different because, like, uh, I would say in the, in, the, in, the, in the more rural areas, life will be more, like, um, restricted, you know, like maybe, like, a very low income uh, you will be forced to work maybe like in the fields, you know, at a very young age, right? M my family didn't force me to work. They kind of gave me like in the beginning of those early years, the choice to um, to help in the market, you know, if I wanted to. It wasn't like, this is your job. You have to be here, you know, like, no. She would, just, my mom would just teach me so I can learn how to like, you know, sell stuff and things like that, right? Yeah, so. So now growing up, when did you kind of start getting exposed to, you know, the gang life or, or you know, stuff like that? Uh, pretty early on, um, since I was little, since I was little, I remember seeing them in, in, in the market, you know, over there in my country. In those years, it was um, 
gangs were booming, you know, and, mm. and they would be walking around freely, faces all tied up, all banged out, and just like right there, right walking past you, you know. The market was controlled by a gang. The, ha the place where we live was controlled by a gang. Everywhere you would go was, was controlled by one gang, you know. So I would see him since I was little, yeah. Now when you saw this, was it more like, I want to be like them, or was it more like, ah, this is normal, like this is just kind of... Well, it was definitely foreign, you know, but but at the same time, it was like appealing in the sense that they projected this like, um, like grandiose lifestyle, you know, like I just, nah, yeah. I couldn't understand it, but it was just like, man, this guy's got something I don't, you know, like it just seems to be um, just attractive, you know, attractive for myself. Mm -hmm. What, what, was there any other like uh, alternative to that? Like, did you see you see the group of the cholos or whatever? Mm -hmm. On the flip side, was there ever like uh, the dudes at negocios or the dudes that had the businesses going on right. or like another role model? I don't want to say role model, but just somebody. Was no, there any? No, not really. Mm -hmm. No, from a from a male perspective, you know. Like I, um, uh. I was raised by all females, like my tias, my mom, my abuela, you know. So um, the whole they were just like a uh, hardworking woman, you know, in, in the markets, right? So I didn't have like this male role model that was a success story, like I, like that I can be like, man, I wanna be a doctor because my tío is a doctor, right? Or like, or like a lawyer because my, my primo's a lawyer, mm. right? No, it was definitely like just my, my the female side of my, my, my female relatives, yeah. I, I wanna touch on something that you said earlier, um, is a sensitive topic of, you know, the the violence that you took part in your family, right? Yes. Um, and I, I don't know if that's the right word to, to say it, but talk to us about that experience because that's really common, not like whether you believe it or not. Yeah, you're right. Like it sounds like a recipe for right. whatever, right? You got the gangs, you got household issues, right? Yeah, bunch of stuff going on. Yeah, it was it was it was brutal because I remember a lot of um, all the times my my dad beating my mother in front of me, right? Wow. Since I was four years old, and. Um, and like you said, it, it got normalized because he got to the point where he would do it in public places and, they, and nobody wanted to get in. Nobody oh, wanted man. to help. So I remember um, fran frantically running away from the market uh, because like my dad is chasing my mom, right? Wow. So, so it, was, um, it, was, it was hurtful because I didn't understand the way that a, an adult understands, but I knew that life was broken, you know, that this was not um, an ideal life, right? So. Um, it kind of makes you feel like, man, like, I got dealt wrong, you know, but I don't know how to get, go about it in any way because I'm four, four or six years old. Right. right? So, so unfortunately, I, I have to witness that, you know, I witness that a lot. And then, of course, he would discipline me and my brother. And this is a typical um, machista man, right? Like, he would, like, beat us and expect us not to cry, you know, because men don't cry, mm -hmm. right? He would, like, um, get us to fight with each other because men are violent. Even to the point where, like, he would beat me for um, the food that I that I wouldn't eat. Like at that time, I I hated onions, right? So like, cooked onions they used to make me throw up, and even if I throw up, he would beat me to eat it, right? So Damn. that was the thing that that was his standard, right? Like, you're a man, and this is what a man does. So all that, you know, um, in those years, you don't realize how much it impacts you. But I I understand it now that when he passed, and and, and we can touch on that in a little bit. But when he passed, it was almost like default. Like, okay, now I'm a, I gotta be a man, and this is the idea of the man that I have imprinted in my mind, and I went from that. You know, so that like you said, it can be a recipe for anything because mm -hmm. you grow up with that anger, you know, that resentment. Yeah. You were young. So, so at a certain point, it sounds like you. <clears throat> would you say you started uh, kind of like your character started mimicking what he right. was doing? Yes, man. Yes. Okay. Um, he gave me my first beer when I was five years old, and he he he, he told me, uh, "Men drink," you know. So so I I wanted to please him. Who, what little boy doesn't want to make right, his father right. proud, you know? So I I downed that beer, my brother and I. And um, I don't remember even feeling drunk or anything. I just remember wanting his approval, right? And um, I remember when, like I said, when uh, fast forward a few years later, I wanted to exper experiment with alcohol because I wanted to. <laughs> to know what he felt like, what my dad, I used to tell myself, like, I want to know what my dad felt like when he was drunk, right? And then, you know, then you become, um, you do it to fit in, you do it because, like, you want to experiment, and then it, it reached a point where, like, now it's an addiction, right? Now you, you, you use it to cope or to escape, right? So that's, it goes out the window from there. Yeah. 
they don't they don't mention that part right no. like it's like hey it's the, once once all the fun and games once the uphill you start going downhill yeah. yeah there's other components to it you know yeah so so you're growing up in El Salvador you you have your dad issues going on in the household um what at what stage did you feel like you started going astray whether that be through gangs at this point or just like the little the little you know travesuras you were doing escalated to just you know or was it going towards that route I would say definitely 11. 11 when my when my father passed. It's young, man. Yeah. Yep. So he passed. He, so that's the last time I saw him alive was when I was six. He came to New York and he was working, sending money. He was staying in touch on the phone. But we never developed a bond, you know, because I resented everything that he had done. So we never developed a bond and he passed away. And I felt that, okay, now I got to be a man because I like my father. And I understood that. I was never going to have anybody that I can call on to, right? Like every little kid um, that gets into a, a fight with somebody else can say, like, oh, I'm going to call my dad. Right. Like, I'm not calling anybody because I have nobody, wow. so I got to be a man myself. So that was a thing that for me was a reality check, and um, my mother kind of, like, sent us to learn a trade, right, to work. She sent us to work because she was like, well, you guys are men. You guys got to learn how to do something for yourself, right? Um, so we started working, um, my brother and I, <clears throat> and that was like when we got exposed to a whole lot of other stuff, right? Um, we were living in the in gang infested area, and we started coming out at night, hanging out with friends, and we started meeting kids that were not gang members, but were going towards that direction, right? So that's when we started like experimenting with cigarettes, alcohol, marijuana, you know, and, and eventually meeting um, active gang members through, through, them, through them kids. At 11. At 11. And how old was your brother? He's a year older than me. Okay, so yeah. you guys were, man, right, right there, same right there. thing. Yeah. And that could be a dangerous duel. Yeah, it's a Like, you guys, thing. same age, let's do it together, let's make yeah. it happen. Yeah. I, can, I mean, even I'm five years apart from my brother, but anything we do together, we do it right. You know, exactly. that's the way yeah. I see it. It's a bond, you know. And yeah. even, like, you know, you have that, that brother um, competition and everything. We, get, we used to get in fights a lot, too. But whenever it came to one of us getting in a fight with somebody else, that we wouldn't let each other get jumped. You know, we mm. I'm back, I got your back and you got mine. Even if yeah. we don't, we mad at the moment. No, we're gonna have each other's back. Yeah. yeah. So that was that that relationship with him, and he progressed to that to um to getting into the gang and, and continuing to doing those things together, mm -hmm. right? But I remember that um, a big part of of me kind of like going towards that route was that I experienced a very traumatic experience when I was 13 and and it was uh it was sexual abuse right so I, I was I was wow. sexually abused when I was 13 and um and it was very um traumatic it was very painful mm -hmm. because at those years like you don't know how to respond to that you don't know how to how to cope with that and um I, I didn't have the comfort that I wanted um at home and crazy as it is um the comfort came from the gang the gang that I was from right because they were the people that took me in, that didn't hold it against me, that kind of retaliated for me um, in, in, in a very, um, you know, um, in a bad way. And that was the, mo the moment where I felt like I made two decisions, right? For one, I was not gonna be a victim anymore, right? I was not gonna let anybody victimize me. Mm -hmm. And I was gonna, and I wanted what they had. Yeah. I wanted a false sense of power, you know, that false sense of control that I can make decisions and I can protect myself, right? Or protect others. So that was a big, big experience for me, um, a pivotal moment in my life that I have never shared uh, publicly. And even when the documentary was happening, um, I didn't have the insight into it, you know? I didn't have, I haven't dealt with it because when I came to unraveling that trauma, I cried like that 13 year old at 23. Mm -hmm. Because I haven't progressed from that emotionally, yeah. you know. So, right. <clears throat> you know, that's um, that's something that people go to therapy for for years, you right? Know? And for me, it was just like suck it up and keep going, you know. So, so that was a uh, um, that was that moment where I kind of like because it comes a lot. A lot of things come from that. I feel for 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 a male, it, it's a, it's traumatic for both genders, right? But I think that for, for a male, it's almost that expectation that you have to prove your manhood, right? Mm -hmm. Because this happens to you, and, and I, was, I was raised in a culture that you can never 
have this happen to you, right? That you, right. you, you, you are a macho, you're a man, that like, you, you can never have this happen to you. And it shatters that, right? So now you have to prove that to yourself and others, right? And then, uh, um, like I said, this is where he came for the default image of a man. That when he came to proving my manhood, the only image I had was the one that my dad left me with. And I took that, that I, I embraced that, right? So I'm gonna be a man, I'm gonna be violent, I'm gonna be reckless, I'm gonna build these walls around me, and I'm gonna let anybody in. Because when I let you in, you betray that, you know? So so that was, uh, um, I would say that was the the main experience that kind of like steered me into that direction. And we appreciate you sharing that because yeah, that's, yeah. that's probably one of the biggest things that even coming out now, if anybody opens up to it, it's the hardest thing to do. Yeah. Um, you said it yourself, you know, therapy is a way that people cope with it, but nobody around here has access to that kind of stuff. Yeah. Nobody knows how to get that kind of help. So yeah, it has to stay in here. There's no way to talk about it. You said it too, the masculinity part, you're not willing to talk about it with anybody else. You can't go to your brother and be like, hey, you know, this is how I'm feeling about it. Yeah. Um, and right. I'm sorry you had to go through that. Yeah. I really am. Um, and for anybody out there like that, you know, let somebody know, open up, talk to somebody. Um, but we appreciate yeah. you sharing that. And it was close too. It's like people you know. Yeah. Right? Which is another harmful thing. So that kind of, and your brother was, your brother was aware of it too or no? Yes. Gotcha. Yes. Okay. Yes. And so this kind of guided you now toward the violent path you said. Yes. So following that, because I know for, at 14 is when you transition over to the United States, right? Yes. So what took time, what took place in between that time after this incident? Um, I submerged into the gang. You know, because like I said, uh, um, I felt that I found the, the the acceptance. I found the the, the shelter in the gang, and um, not that they knew what what had happened, but I just felt like these people embraced me because at my house, so I didn't feel embraced. You know, yeah. because this experience was like it was something difficult not only for me but for my mother to deal with. You know, so I don't oh. think she had the um, mm. the skills to to deal with it. Right, she was also mourning the death of my father recently, so. Yeah. She was going through her own st her, own, her own stuff, and I just took on the streets. You know, I took a, I took advantage of her absence emotionally to go to the streets. So I just started like taking into that 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 gang mentality. You know, like I'm gonna become a gang member because this is this is my family now, right? Yeah. So so I submerged into that, and um, I did um, anything and everything that was required for me to become a gang member. You know. For, for for a gang member in El Salvador, was 13 years old, like, common Great to yes. see kids already gangbang? Because, you know, out here, it's a different age bracket. It ranges, but right. for the most part, you're not going to see very many 12, 13-year-olds, you know? Yes. It was, unfortunately, it was common because um, it's almost like they recruit you at those ages because you have a longer career, you know, mm. ahead of you, right? And at that time, the max sentence for a minor was five or seven years in prison, right? So... You had, you still had like, it was just like a slap in the wrist, you know, like you're gonna, you're gonna come out, you know. Yeah. So um, we didn't have that, that fear like here, like oh, even if I'm young, I can still get trashed as an adult. Yeah. Over there at that time, they didn't have those laws, right? So I definitely took advantage of that because I felt like I was invincible, you know. Mm. I have all this anger, I have all this resentment, and and violence is the outlet, you know. This is like the place where I can not only do these things but i can reinvent myself you know i can wear this mask and be like oh they call me so and so from this neighborhood right because i don't like who juan is because juan is broken juan has been victimized juan is uh, uh insecure right yeah so i'm gonna i'm gonna overcompensate for all these things with the mask the mask that the gang offers me so that was my my unfortunately that was my the way i chose you know the way i chose to go and like you said earlier, maybe I didn't have role models, but I do understand today that that was my choice. You know, like even if mm. I didn't have role models, there were things um, that I could have done that not to choose the, the gang. You know, yeah. it was just the a bad decision that I made at that, at that, mm. at that time. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, at that age, though, your your thought processing capabilities aren't there. Right. You're you're still developing. There's no way, even as an adult, people make dumb decisions. You know what I mean? So. Um, it's kind of crazy to think that a 13-year-old can 
say for sure this is the right decision or not. You yeah. know, 13 years old, that is hella young. And running around with, with like other people your age, like it, it almost sounds like that was the way you go outside and play. Yeah. Like out here, it's like you go, you ride your bikes, you play your football, you play your hockey or whatever, whatever it was. But at that time, that was your way of going outside and play. Exactly. That was a regular. Exactly. Um, now you started getting into all these activities. Um, did you ever get incarcerated in El Salvador? I did. Really? I did. Uh, that, 13. That yeah. must have been another experience in itself too. Yes. So I was, I was wrongfully incarcerated. Um, and that's another story, man. You know, um, the police system over there is not as it is right here. So there is mm -hmm. um, there was this um, incident where I got I got I got caught up in an area that I was not local to. <clears throat> and I was involved in criminal activities. I just wasn't doing what they accused me of. They accused mm -hmm. me of robbery, and I wasn't I wasn't robbing anybody. So they they threw me in jail for six days. You know, and I'm 13 years old, and um, <clears throat> I had left the house. So my mother didn't know. My mother didn't know that I wasn't coming home because I had when I left the uh, when I made the decision to join, that was it. Like I left the house and I and I and I went and I with the gang. I was running amok with the gang 24/7, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, I get arrested, and I hadn't seen my mother for six months, you know, by then. And I saw her through this jail cell, you know, and she came and visited me, and it was like five minute visits, you know, that's it. And then, um, as crazy as it sounds, like my whole mindset at the time was like, what am I doing? What wasn't, what am I doing here? Or like, yeah. I can't be allowing, I can't be allowing myself to do this. No, my whole mindset was like, next time I come over here, I'm gonna be ready, you know, I'm gonna Damn. be a main gang yeah. member, you know. That, because at that time I wasn't official yet, I was I was going through the process, so that was my mindset, right? And um, yeah, it was, it's crazy, it's like insane, you know, to think about at that age. You say like um, people play with video games, you know. There's kids that be like just like I, I don't know playing with toys or something. Yeah, man. Still, yeah. some people still do, right. you know. And I'm over there game banging and thinking I'm a man and everything, right? Well, now you experienced both systems for both sides, the United States system and the El Salvador system. Yeah. Were they very similar, or you feel like they were pretty different? Very different. The system within the system is completely different in here. So for gangs, they run diff they run different inside, and the police is completely different. Over there is more brutal, definitely. You have less rights, it seems, you know, especially nowadays. Um, but at the, in those years, it was still um, it was still hard, you know. Mm -hmm. You in the cell and. Uh, it's not like you're gonna have a celly, man. You're gonna they're gonna put nine, twenty people in there with you if you know whatever they gotta fit in, you know. Wow. So I was there with like nine people in one cell. Man. Yeah, and there's no mattresses, no no blankets, nothing, you know. Okay. Yeah. How long were you in there for? When? Uh six days. Six days. Yeah. Okay, so thankfully you weren't in there for, for a long stretch, but yeah. moms came and saved you. Um or, or no. did she jump, come in to help you out? She she did, but I, I got released because there was no evidence. I didn't oh. I didn't rob anybody, mm -hmm. you know. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, well, oh no! Uh -huh. Just Go real ahead. quick, was that experience not enough to say, "Fuck this, I'm cool. I don't want to be in here with 20 dudes and then with those fucking type of conditions." No. Was that ever a thought? No, no, because like I said, um, I have embraced the gang as my family. So I was mm. there with my brothers. You know, I was there, and that was the the, the mindset that that we're gonna ride it out. You know, as as, yeah. as in the gang. So you um, when you have a gang mentality, like it becomes more than your family is like your religion, your creed, you know? Yeah. So that was my, my mindset at the time. Gotcha. That's, passion could definitely be a strong thing when it comes to, especially family too. Yeah. Um, now I want to talk about uh, what kind of led, what led you to the United States from there. What was that transition like? What was it like getting even over here? Um, did, was that an experience in itself? Yes. So I didn't want to come to the United States initially. So I have a, my stepdad was the one that got us papers and, um, that didn't want to come over here because I like what I had going on in my yeah. country, you know. I uh, also had a um, a girlfriend at the time that was six months pregnant, my firstborn, my, my firstborn son. Wow. So I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to make the same bad decision that my my, my father did mm -hmm. and just leave my my, my my child, you know. Yeah. So, but at the same time, I understood that I have nothing to offer him. I was 14 years old. I didn't I didn't have a, a trade. I didn't ha I didn't know I didn't have a job. You know, I wasn't gonna live off extortion or, or robberies or things like that. So my mother convinced me to come to the United States and work for six months and then go back and see my son and keep doing that. Six months here, six, mo six months over there, right? And that is the only reason why I agreed to come. 
because I wanted to make some money, you know. So I, um, I came over here and I was working landscaping in San Diego with an uncle I had. So I turned, I came um, a month before turning 15. You know, I started right, right when I came, I started working the next day. And, and um, you know, that was my whole thing. Like, I, I'm not afraid of work. You know, I can work anything just yeah. as long as I'm getting paid and I'm sending money back, right? So, so it was a little bit, in the beginning, it wasn't so much of a reality check because it didn't feel too, like, I didn't really get out of the house. I was just, like, working, working and going to the house. So I didn't really see the United States as I got to see after, you know? At, at, so at 15 years old, you're living like basically the the what we see on TV is like the migrant life. Yes, you're, you're living with the you know anyone that comes undocumented that are just here to get money. Yes, from the house to work and that's it. 12 yes. hour shifts probably. You're working yeah. all day. Monday through Sunday. Yeah, yeah. my yeah. God, 15 years 15. old, huh? Yeah. So so you, it sounds like you came in with the right mentality and you were doing what you had to do. How did you even get to the point where you found? Um, either homeboys or you decided to go back towards that that kind of route did something right. go wrong in what you were in the working and all that yeah a, a few things i think that kind of like set the stage for that for my for me to make that decision because i wasn't really planning on going back you know but when my mother told real, real me, quick back to el salvador at that point no back to the gang okay gotcha. uh, yep, yep. yeah i wasn't mm -hmm. going to reunite with the gang because in my mind i was only here short term right so i was going to make Makes money sense. and go back right but then my mother came over and she put me in high school, right? And I'm like, I didn't come here for go to school. I came here to work. Man. And she was like, well, you're a minor and you're under my authority and you're not going back. So when she told me that, I felt betrayed. You know, I'm like, man, that was not the plan. So yeah. I got angry, you know? And I, but I do love school. So I kind of went into the high school and I did like it. You know, the only barrier was the language, of course. I didn't speak English at the time. Mm. So I was... I had a, mo a moment in my life where I have friends that were normal. Like these kids didn't even know I was a gang member. Wow. And they treated me normal, right? And I remember thinking back and, 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 and telling myself, man, I can do this. Real you know? quick, what was normal to you? So <clears throat> normal was that we were not getting into fights. We were not orchestrating missions. We were not, you know, like doing like, we were not hurting people. We were just regular yeah. teenagers, you know? We were just regular teenagers. Yes, yeah, so sometimes we'll go to the beach and like get drunk, you know, but we didn't get stupid drunk, you know, we yeah. would just just have those experiences, you know. Mm -hmm. And I and I and I remember thinking that I can do it, that I that I I kinda like this normalcy, right? But I didn't have I didn't have the um how can I say like you took me out of the neighborhood but you didn't take the neighborhood out of me, right? Mm -hmm. So I almost had this pressure from the gang in my country where they told me like a hey, your six months been passed, you know, like, you're not doing anything over there for the, for the gang, you're not even sending us money. Like, if you're not gonna do something for the gang, don't even think about coming back. So having that pressure on my mind made me think like, well, if I don't, if I, if I cannot go back to my country and what the streets where I grew up, then what's the point? You know, like, that's my, that's my family, you know, that's, that's, that's my area. So I'm gonna, I gotta do something, right? Mm -hmm. So. That was a little bit of a push, and um, I decided to look for them. I decided to, um, I started asking the school, you know, where the gang's territories, you know, and it happened. My mother made the mistake of moving right into the neighborhood. Wow. And if she wouldn't have known, she would have never moved. But this is not in San Diego no more. No, this you is in up, L.A. You moved to L.A. Yeah, we have moved you... to L.A. So, so um, I saw the graffiti on the walls, and I was like, I'm gonna go out and find these these guys, right? So I grab a bike and I go out, and the first guys that I see, I run up on them and I just ask them, you know, I just ask them, and they turned out to be from the same gang. So <clears throat> I just uh, that from that moment on, that was the last six months of my freedom at 16, you know. So I was a year and eight months in this country, freely doing not like you mm -hmm. know, but the last six months I spent gambling. And I and I got a life sentence on the last six months. The last six wow. months out yeah. of the eighteen. Yeah. So those so all what was it, twelve months basically, you're doing everything you have to do, everything's cool. Yeah. You would think that might be enough time to brainwash you a little bit towards yeah. that mindset. Mm -hmm. A yeah. year is a long time, you know. I get at that age I get it, no. Right? You think life is never gonna end and, and Well it was difficult at the same time because like my mother was struggling, you know, like she yeah. didn't 
she came here and the same thing that I was going through with the cultural barriers, the language barriers she was going through, you know? Same thing. So she had to work um, to provide single mother. My, my stepdad abandoned us, you know, so she was a single mother and uh, she was working hard and uh, she was coming home and being stressed out, you know, being stressed out. We didn't have the best of relationship at the time, you know, so I just used to, talk, to, to take to the streets. Like I remember walking, um, Early in the morning, like what time you go to school? Like at eight, eight thirty. Yeah, about yeah. I would walk at six. I was I would walk all the way over there, and I just sit there waiting for the school to open, because I didn't want to be at home, because we have a very uh, um, dysfunctional relationship with my mother, where it's um, it's chaotic in the house, right? So I would just avoid it. I would just walk and sit outside of school, just wait for it to open, and just go in. And the same thing after after going back, because I know that if I'm there in the house. We're gonna get in an argument. I'm gonna get my ass whooped. You know, something's gonna happen every day. Mm -hmm, right. You know. Yeah. So, so, um, I think that if I wouldn't have maybe like maybe a role model or like something a good program that I can get into, that I would have known about and commit myself to it, that would have been a little different. You know, because like I told you guys, I like school. I used, I used to like high school. Right. It felt like a university. You know, mm -hmm. like compared to the size and the experience as and back home, it feels like a university. Right. So I like that element. I just didn't, like I kept thinking about that stuff, you know? I didn't get that out of my mind. Yeah. Well, so your brother was out here as well? No. Oh, okay. Not, not, not in those years. Okay. Because no. I was just thinking, do you think the, like, the whole, oh, the pressure from back home, was that coming from your bro or something because they had access to him or something? It just, I'm just thinking because it sucks that you had that type of pressure. And right. Even though you were in a whole nother country, you still felt it. Like you still felt obligated, you know. So, so definitely, some it didn't come from my brother. So my brother always, in the since the beginning, <clears throat> my brother always tried to like prevent me from joining, right? Mm -hmm. Like he always told me like not to join because he got he got made before, you know. So he always told me not to join, and um, I didn't listen to you know because I wanted to be I wanted to be part of the structure that he was part of, right? And um, it was something that was attractive to me for all the wrong motives, like the false sense of confidence, belonging, purpose, you name it, right? That that was my my decision. But at that time, he was serving time in prison in my country. So uh. as a minor, he was, he was in prison. So the pressure from him only came that if I was to do wrong in the gang, it was gonna be pressure on him. So I couldn't allow that to go on him because that's my bro, mm -hmm. you know? But the but the other side of the of the pressure came from the gang because I still kept in touch with them. You know, even though I was here, I was talking to the homies. I was I was I was uh, having conversations with them, and um, even my 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 girlfriend at the time, she was a former gang member, and she was giving me pressure. Like she was telling me, oh, like, like, "What are you doing over there, man? Your cause is right here. Like this is your homies. This is your yeah. family." So I used to feel like, man, you're right, you know? And, and, and now that I look back, it's like, how stupid can I be? <laughs> you yeah, know? like I'm thinking you can kind of just hang up and I know it doesn't seem like <laughs> you have that option. Exactly. You they know, you're a whole could. country away and yeah. you know out here people go to jail. It's not like yeah. it's corrupt or whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, but I can see that where the pressure, yeah. you got your girl, you got just the environment. You really came from that environment. So it was, it was a tangible feeling. You can feel yeah. that pressure, those ties. And your then, son and your mom was accessible too. Was exactly, yeah. too. my whole family over there. They all live in the in the in the gang territory, you know. So, it was like I cannot, I cannot let go, you know, because it doesn't just affect me. It's gonna affect more people, right? You know. So that was the last push that I that I that kind of like propelled me to to look for them. Did Did anyone in that environment, um, whether the homies or any family, uh, did any one person ever say like? Dude, you made it to to what they say the picture perfect America and American dream. white white fence picket fence. Don't worry about this shit. Did anybody ever tell you that on the side? No. Well, my mother, my mother, she would tell me that, cause cause at first she would she thought that I was messing up, and she would accuse me of like coming home drunk or high, and I'm like, mom, I'm not doing anything, man. You know, and, and but but it, but it was that that lack of trust that I have made mm -hmm. her feel for me that yeah. before I violated her trust, you know, the times that mm -hmm. she would let me out, I would come out drunk and high, you know? So, so now that I wasn't doing it, she was just like accusing me of doing those things. And, and, but she would tell me that like, like you can start fresh, you can do something else. But in that immature mind, I used to tell myself, I can never be more than a gang member. You know, that's, that's who I am, you know? 
So that was like all the bad, all the wrong decisions for me. Mm -hmm. So I wanna so now I wanna touch on kind of basically where your charges came into play, and that's kind of like what led to your experience in the documentary too. Um, so you're being accounted you're accounted for two charges, right? I was charged with two charges, but only convicted for one. Right now, the film that they show in the documentary that was, those were the, that was where the charges were coming from. Yes. What led to that day, um, from when that incident took place? So at that so that, at that time that I had rejoined the gang, like I said, that was the last six months of my of my freedom. Mm -hmm. I was I had a plan, right? I had a plan to make a name for myself, right? To 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 do things right so that when I went back home, nobody was gonna say anything to me yeah. and be like, hey, what have you done? Like, you didn't do anything, right? And that was what I did. I came into the gang picture in LA and I realized that it was nothing like back home, you know? And I and I have all this like, this school of thought as a gang member of what is what gangs are supposed to be like. And I pushed that line here, you know? I started like, implementing a lot of those things that we will we, we'll do back home mm -hmm. and everything selfishly man selfishly and, and callously it was about about making my reputation you know it wasn't um it wasn't that nobody forced me there is that element that you cannot say no to a mission in the game right you cannot say no you cannot decline to go right but i also wanted it right because yeah. of what it will come after so it's, it's, it's unfortunate to say like that because there was a human being, right? Yeah. And, and now that I have come to terms with that and I look back, it's like, there's nothing that justifies that. There's nothing that, that makes sense of that. And he did not deserve it, you know? So it was almost as using him as a means to an end. And, and, and I'm sorry, you know, I'm sorry that I, that I did that because what I got from it, the sentence, it's not enough. You know, there, there's nothing that can be enough to replace that, to, to give back a life, right? So it's, it's, it's just, it's hard still to, to think and talk about it because like I was mentioning earlier to you guys, um, for a lot of people, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve my second chance, right? You, 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 you took somebody's life, you killed somebody, you should die in prison. And I understand that completely. I understand that. And and um, I want to see that. I want to see on, on my side, it's like I'm giving a chance to life. So I have a responsibility to live. And I'm going to make the best of this life as I can. Right? Because I cannot rewind my life and go back and change those events. But I can do something today that I, that I can maybe leave a legacy mm -hmm. in the future. Right, and, and that we see 100%. that too. We see that too, one hundred percent on like how we've talked to during the pre-screening, like what your plans are and what you want to do. Um, you are one of the definitions of rehabilitation. You know, you are definitely a role model for others that are coming out of the reentry system or the system and being able to understand and mature. Um, but then again, that took a lot of time because I know you went through a lot of practice, a lot of mental practice, a lot of just a whole switch up, right? And we're gonna touch on that. Now, when the incident took place after that, um, what happened in between? They, did they catch you right then and there that same day or no. they picked you up a few weeks later? I was out for three months. I was out for three months and I continued living the lifestyle. It validated my, my, my status as a gang member. It gave me that false sense of respect, of, of, of notoriety, right? And I got drunk with it, you know? I got drunk with it, uh, I was 16 years old. And I thought I was like, I was doing big things, right? Mm -hmm. So I continued the same lifestyle, man, from October to January. And, and unfortunately, on January 8th, I attempted to kill somebody else. And thank God this man survived. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I got arrested three days after that, you know? So that was my, my progression, right? And in, um, in the self-help groups and CGA, they talked about the the, the the OCP, the obsession, the compulsion, and the progression. So when I had obsessed myself into building this reputation, right, and this, at this point in time, then I compulsed and I took somebody's life and I progressed mm -hmm. to wanting to do more because I realized that this gave me a false sense of glorification. This gave me status, this gave, this gave me power, right? And I wanted more. As a gang member, what's the point of you joining if you don't want to climb to the top, 
right? If you don't yeah. want to become eventually a shot caller, right? Like you have to have ambition, and this is the distorted sense of ambition, right? Very. That that in the gang you pursue that, you know. This is like a that's what they call those career criminals because you progress, right? Mm -hmm. And the whole point is to make it to the top. So that was and and those years, that was what I wanted, you know. So now the day that, that they, they arrested you, what was that like? Because this is way different now. You're getting arrested yeah. out here, yeah. right? It's your first time getting arrested at that point. Yes. What was that experience like for you? I definitely knew that. So I was walking down the streets. I was going to go eat some pupusas. And <laughs> some I, yeah. pupusas. Hey, there you go. It. <laughs> and I was hungry, man. I was high and I was had the Real munchies. quick. I know yeah. this is off topic. What kind of pupusas do you like, though? The, the cheese ones, the queso. Ah, that's what's yeah. up. All right, yeah. that's what we're. All right, uh huh. And then uh, um, I was walking there, and I was with a couple of the people, um, and then the the crash unit just pulls up. They mm -hmm. got me on a, on, a, on a light, right? And as soon as they saw me, they bolted out of the car, and I knew, I knew that they had me for something, right? Yeah. And I it did like I thought about running, but I was with um, the mother of my second son, right? So I, wow. I was with her, and she ran. So in my mind, I'm thinking, I can outrun them, but I don't want her getting caught, right? So I'm, I'm just like, I, I just let them arrest me, right? I just, they arrested me. They didn't tell me anything, right? They, they didn't say anything to me. And I knew that when they cuffed me up and they just threw me in the car, I was like, yeah, this is serious. Like, I felt it, you know? They didn't mm -hmm. say anything. They didn't read me my rights. No Miranda moment. rights. Right, that's what I'm thinking too, yeah. Not at the moment. They went to, I went to the station and they left me there for like three hours just, just cooking in the cell, mm -hmm. you know? And then they came and told me that I'm on the rights, right? And it was what it it was this one officer that arrested me. That um, story goes that he was so obsessed with the gang that I was from that he went to my country to study it, right? Wow! And came here, oh, yeah. and he would tell me, "I'm gonna get you one day. I'm gonna get you." So that that's the one thing that he did tell me when he arrested me. He said, "I told you I was gonna get you." And 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 you know, well now no, like I'm, I'm glad that he arrested me. I, 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 didn't deserve to be in the streets on those on those times, right? But but I remember thinking like, yeah, this is serious. Mm -hmm. So when he came and read my rights and he told me, initially I was charged with the attempted murder, and then after I got charged with the murder case, mm -hmm. yeah. So going through juvenile hall, my best options was juvenile life, and then they wanted to send me to adult court, fighting my fitness for the attempted murder. Once I got I charged with the murder. He sent me straight to adult court, both cases. It was it's what they call direct file. Like you get a direct file to adult system because you have been deemed not suitable for juvenile courts. You know, these are serious crimes. So they don't want us. Like in the, in the documentary, I remember like if the, there is a politician, I think, that's, that says like if you raise somebody, you're an adult. If you commit a murder, you're an adult. Right? Mm -hmm. You're going to do adult time. Yeah. So that Language. was still yeah. happening in 2012. Right. Yeah. So uh, with that too, now you're going. You went. They, get, they put you in the juvenile halls now at this yes. point. Um, before the doc, what was your experience like going to the juvenile halls? Because now you're exposed to being in a cell with nine, ten people. Yeah. Now you have your own cell, or you might even be on your own. What was that experience like for you? It was stressful. It was definitely stressful. I didn't know how to do time. You know, I didn't know how to keep myself occupied. Um, it was very different. Like you said, I was alone in a cell. I was forced to, to just be with myself right there, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not like I can distract myself. And then I don't know the language still. So I have that barrier and I have a lot of kids that are my enemies, right? That they don't yeah. want to talk to me, they want to beat me up. And then the, you have that like hostile environment. Mm -hmm. so, Did you know about that beforehand? Like going in, hey, this is how they do it. It's no. gang banging and stuff. No. So no you walk idea, right huh? into it? No now. idea. I didn't yeah. even know half the neighborhoods that right. would be from wow. the right. Yeah. Yeah. So I had to find out in a bad way, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, getting in fights and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, so it was very, um, I, I, I used to get, like, like um, very anxious in the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. And especially the weight of the time, right? That, and that played a part, too. Like, I remember thinking, like, man, it got serious, especially in adult court. Like, when I went to adult court the first time, I... I they gave me a, a public defender, and he looked at me, and he said, hey, man, how old are you? And I said, I'm 16. And he said, well, babe, you better grow up, because when, you need, when you're going, you need to be a man. That's what he told me, right? Wow. So, so and, and, and that was the public defender's uh, um, approach to you, right? They gave me another one, and he came to me, and he's, he's like, oh, casual, right? He sits with me at the table, 
And he's like, hey, man, I'm just going to, like, go through some questions. You know, you're going to get life. We're just going to prepare you for trial. Oh, my God. I'm wow. like, what the fuck? You have, I'm like, you're not going to give me any hope. He's like, nah, nah, you're getting life, man. You know, I'm just going to go through the proceedings and everything else, right? Oh, so shit. I'm like, what the fuck? So I, I, that's when you got, like, it, weigh you, it weighs you down, right? Mm -hmm. you, have a, you have, I was fighting two life sentences. So you have those two life sentences above you that just weigh you down, right? So it's like, fuck, man, what the fuck did I do? You know? Right. I can't imagine what is going through your mind when that happens. Like, mm -hmm. you're just, like, what goes, like, are you thinking about your son? Are you thinking about your family? Are you thinking about yourself? Like, what's going through your mind? Yes, I had a um, very surface uh, reflection right there, right? Like, I um, I would think a lot about my, my mother, my sister, right? My son's mother was two months pregnant, right? So I would think about that and, like, man, I messed up, you know? Like, I messed up, like... I made exactly the same mistakes my father did. You know, I have, a, I have a child over there in my country that I'm not part of his life. I have another one coming over here that I'm not gonna be there either, you know? So, and, and I started doing the math. Like, I'm, I'm like, man, I'm, I'm 16, best case scenario, if I get 25 of life, I'm gonna be this many years when I get out. Crazy. And it's like, oh man, like I fucked up, you That's know? Crazy. Yeah. It, it's nuts even thinking back on it, right? You don't even understand the ramifications of all this. No. You're saying these crazy football numbers, you're going through the stuff in your head, even the PD situation, right? Yeah. You're like, why is he, I thought on the, on the movies, they say they're supposed to help you and we're gonna yeah. get witnesses and we're, yeah. And you're like, this is not what it is, right? Your brain can't even comprehend that at that damn age. No, no. And, and you go through a process, you know, like I went through this process where like I have, I would like, you know, bargain with God. I'll pray to God and I will make this like, mm -hmm. oh, please let me go home and I'll do yeah. good, you know? And, 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 uh, and it got to a point where like I stopped, I stopped praying for freedom and I understood more or less what I have done, right? It's still, I wouldn't say surface, it was a little more in depth, but it was still not to the point where I came to understand and develop insight in prison. But I started praying for mercy because I, I understood that I have hurt a lot of people, you mm -hmm. know, and I, and, I, and I asked God for, for mercy. You know, like I understood that I was going to serve time, that I needed to go to prison. I just started praying for don't give me a crazy amount of time. You yeah. Know? yeah. Was there a particular incident that led to that realization? Where you're like, instead of trying to go home or, God, please let me go. I won't ever do it again to, you know what? I did mess up and I did, I do deserve time. Was there like a, in any particular incident? If I'm, I'm sure there is, and I cannot remember, but I remember somebody telling me to put myself in his shoes, mm. right? And that was the thing that I didn't do it at that, at that day. I kind of, I kind of like just thought about like, what would it, what would it be like for him? And, and, and. Not if it was me, but what it what it was like for him to to no longer be alive, right? Mm -hmm. So I just thought about that, and I started reflecting, and I was like, man, like I messed up, you know, like I messed up because I felt like it was senseless, you know. Even at that even at man. that age, I felt like it, it was senseless, you know. I couldn't I couldn't justify it in my mind. So that was when I started thinking about it different, you know. And I, and I began doing a little bit of changes in myself. You know, I was going to church, I was going to groups, whatever they offer, um, creative writing, right? They had an inside writer's class in Juvie, so that was a big outlet for me to just write my life, you know, like in a poem, right? First mm -hmm. I wanted to rhyme, then it just became like, I wanna pour my feelings into this, which was the very early stages of reflection, very early stages yeah. of, of insight. Ah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, so that was you know in the cells you you, you in, in the compound you leave in the cells for a while, so so that's when I started reading books, I started looking at the dictionary trying to learn English you know the English Spanish, and I would just like because I was forced to it you know like I was there, and um, every time I come out I asked the homies like hey man what does this mean you know how do you pronounce this how do you use it in a sentence and he they will help me right, and then. Uh, um, because it's suck not to be able to talk to people, like especially the staff, is they are African Americans, and like you have that language barrier. Like when I get in, a, I got in a fight one one time, and um, they were asking me because I fought in um, in mass. You know, I got in a fight. I disrespected the church, so they were mad, man. These guys like, were beating me up, and, and they were mad at me because I, I got in, I got in a fight in mass, and I couldn't like, I, I couldn't even talk crap to them back, you know, because I, I didn't know how to explain, right. express right. myself. <laughs> So because of that, they just left me in the, in, in the box, in the hole for longer time, you know, and they were just those little things that, like, pushed me to learn, you know? Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I'm fascinated by the fact that towards the when well, when we saw you when we saw you on the when everyone saw you on the documentary at right. that point it seemed like you knew English already like yeah, full blown like I didn't see any the so you learned fast as hell yeah or is that what it was within a year well a, a year. year yeah because by the time of the documentary no maybe a year and a half I think because by the time the documentary happened it was like a year and a half so yeah I just I just. You know, you develop that ear, like when you play music, and you develop that ear to kind of mm-hmm. like, oh, okay, just yeah, play yeah. on the C scale, you know, and you can you can reproduce it, right? It's almost like that, right? Like I I started like, it will, there will be times where like you would, you would tell me something, and I'll be like I panic and I'll be like oh I don't speak English, but then I go to the cell and I and I and I and I answer you in my mind. And I'm like man, I knew how to answer this guy, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I was insecure about my accent because in the documentary uh-huh. I have a thicker accent, man. It's like man, like I was embarrassed about it, right? And then guys making fun of me, right? Yeah. But that, but I also had good friends that kind of like allowed me to just talk and right. mess it up, and you know, just they wouldn't say anything. Like they would they mm. would correct me instead, yeah. you know. <laughs> Which helped because that's part of the learning process, right? Yeah. Is is doing all that. Yeah. Um. So so we all know you from the documentary. They call us monsters, right? Mm-hmm. Um. If I remember correctly, Jared said that they approached everyone. Yes. Uh, maybe walk us through that. How how that happened? The right. day where they came in and they said, "Hey, we're gonna present this. Do you guys want want to jump on board?" I think they made an announcement in in a class, and they were like, "Hey, this is an opportunity. If you guys want to get involved, sign up." You had to go through a, an approval process. I think your judge had to approve you or something like that. Mm. So um, I think we had a we 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 signed something, and then we introduced the papers to the judge and everything. And whoever got approved was allowed to. Whoever didn't. Then, then not. I don't honestly. I don't know how we ended up being the ones, because there was a lot of people that got interested. Really? You know, yeah, yes. Yeah, so. Crazy how that works, huh? Yeah. And then like, it so happened to be you guys, and you guys are here now, and you yeah. guys maintain this crazy relationship from that. But yeah. So yeah. you guys, uh, so you you signed up for it. You get picked basically. This was it like announced like a lottery or something? I can't remember. I can't remember. I know that they. Um, I know. I think they told us. I think maybe uh, Scott Budnick told us. Um, that they were gonna be ah. into in in the and then the, they told us the day and then we got walked to the unit and everything you know we used the empty unit X at the time wasn't being used yeah and then I met Gabe and Ben yeah and all the whole crew how did it feel seeing the cameras like first time like come to you and right start? right it was it was very um, very weird man I remember we we used to joke around you know and kind of like talking to the camera like just like, staring <laughs> to the camera you know do dumb yeah. stuff you know. So it was. It, it took a little bit of getting used to it. Yeah. yeah. I one thing I always bring up too. I even brought up Jared's stuff. Like even the activity that you guys were doing was fantastic because it gave you your voice. You were yes. able to tell your story. Whether yes. you weren't saying it's my story, you're able to tell your story through the activity. Yes. Um. What was that experience like? You when doing these activities, writing your own movie, you were putting, you were pouring a lot into it. Yes. Um, how did that feel for you? It felt good. You know, it felt like. Um, I feel like all of us maybe have that desire to 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 be mm. to be known in a different light because when you see us on paper, it's like man, like these guys are monsters. These guys are criminals or gang members. You know, like you should lock him up and throw away the key. But but this was an opportunity for us to show humanity, right? And we weren't trying to do it. We were, they just told us like be yourselves, you know. So so for me it was um, let me show you where I come from. That at the time I didn't have the understanding I have now. But I want, but I knew, right? I knew that there were factors in my life that play a play a role into me um, choosing to become a gang member. So I wanted people to see me different, you know. I wanted people to know that yeah, I have feelings, you know. That we 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 want to be um, with our families, you know. We want to be in love. We want to be, you know, free one day, you know. So that yeah. was it. Was it was a good experience, yeah. What's the, what was your thing with love? <laughs> I want to know. What yeah. Was it, what yeah. Was well, my boy had, had two you kids were already. Hard. Yeah. Before, by 16, yeah. two kids already, two kids, right? So my boy kids. was definitely a, the loving type, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. You were crushing yeah. pretty hard. I forgot how hard you were crushing on that yeah. girl. But um, but one thing that did touch me is that final call. Yeah. You know, and then the goodbye. Like That was probably, the, I don't know if since then, but that was probably the last goodbye. That was that the was last. The, it yeah. Really? Yeah. That was the last time I talked to her. And you know, the reason why I offer that story was because I have had experiences with with women before. Mm-hmm. But Abigail was a puppy love story. That was like the almost the purest sense of love I knew 
at the time, right? Wow. That was the, because my, all my relationships after that were dysfunctional mm-hmm. with older women, gang members, you know, there was a lot into the relationships that I know that they had rough lives too. These women have rough lives. So we were both broken and we were trying to like be one whole when you were broken. pieces yes. that could connect. So I didn't want to bring that into, that's the, maybe not the typical relationship, but that was something that I felt like maybe the public didn't want to know about, you know? Mm. So Abigail was the one, it could have happened, man. Cause she was a great person. She was a good friend. And um, it just, I knew that I wasn't going to be a good influence for her at that, mm-hmm. I, at that age, you know? And I'm glad that it didn't happen because I would have ruined that, right? Like yeah. maybe like that was the last time I talked to her. But if I get her, I get her phone number and I call her and I talk to her right now, we're still cool, you know, because I didn't hurt her. I didn't mess that up, you know, as opposed to my other relationships that I did hurt those women and, and, and we're not in good terms. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's great to hear the maturity that was Man, already taking place. It's insane. It's night and day. Yeah. Like straight, it was already taking place from jump. Um, what was your exper- what if what was your experience like when they brought in the actors and things like that? Oh. They started kissing in front of y'all, y'all looking at each other yeah. like you know. <laughs> I saw you and Jared in there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, you had you know they had a, you had a beautiful actress, uh, Nora Kilpatrick, right? So that was that that was like for us being away from females and, and looking at a beautiful woman. That that was a little yeah. aspect of it, but it was almost like embarrassing to see that played out because that's something that you thought about, you know, like that we put into. Wow. into writing right yeah. so it's like oh man it's happening you know so so it was pretty cool it was pretty cool and we got that first role you know it's like we never really like this is how movies get made type of thing you know and we're there right that's so true. that was like yeah. it was a great experience yeah that's yeah. true you guys are funny man every time like every opportunity i saw where you guys were together y'all were just dabbing each oh other yeah up. yeah like, <laughs> i'm like hey they dabbed each other yeah. up like 10 times just I like know. every time jared told me the same thing but when we watched the the, the film and iron he's like man bro we were shaking hands the whole time <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, was, that was you man <laughs> oh you yeah. told him that was you man. Yeah. and you would get up with a hug and everything yeah, yeah. but i mean i i get it like those are you know these are your your friends at the yeah. same time you know y'all are both you you know, you have life experiences and y'all can relate at one point, but you know, you're still human at the end of the day. Like yeah. you want to be able to speak and laugh and do all that yeah. with somebody else. Um, so now following the doc, when, when Daryl left, was there anything that you were interested about on that part too? Like, were you like, damn, that's crazy. Like, did that affect you in any way? When Daryl left? Yeah, or Antonio too, Antonio. And I'm thinking experience. maybe Daryl too, because he got sentenced. So he was the first one that got thrown right. those numbers and you guys true. maybe yeah. out of the group seen somebody like, okay, he got yeah. sentenced already. His, you know. Yeah, well, we were we were already seeing people like he got, he got love, you know, he got 15 mm-hmm. years flat, you know, and, and mm. for, for what we were facing, that was love because all the other kids that were with us in the unit, they were getting like 35 to life, 50 to life, mm. you know, they were like, kids that were younger getting 80 to life, you know, wow. 15 years old. So when Daryl mm-hmm. left, it was almost like, man, you, you, you got lucky, right? So, so he left, right? And then when Antonio, Antonio left, it was like, man, that was like such a blessing, man. Like from having faced 90 years to life to getting nine months in camp, you know? So it was like, you, you, you have that, that I wish that was me, you know, like, I wish, like, man, you do good, man, and enjoy it and make the best of it because we all want to be in your shoes, Mm -hmm. but you're the one that's going to walk away from here, you know? That was the, that was the the sentiment, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did they ever update you guys on what's happening with Antonio on the outside? Like, did they tell you guys what was going on or that still kept, like... Yes, but at that moment, no, because he went through his little journey and then we went through our, our, so we, Mm -hmm. we, we kept in touch, you know, for the most part, and we saw, I saw Daryl and and Jared in, in prison, and then we would hear things because we kept in touch with Ben and 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 um he would know about all of us. He would kept in touch with all of us. Yeah. Shout out to Ben. Yo, Ben is in yeah. the building if y'all don't know it or not. Yeah. I wish yeah, you could come be. come on, Ben, real quick. Get in front yeah. real quick. Just yeah. say yeah. what's yeah. up. Yeah. Come on. They'll recognize you. The yeah. director that brought us some yeah. fantastic yeah. film, man. He's right here. What's up? Sure. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yep. <laughs> um, in the house. But we appreciate you for providing the story because this story is like, it's fantastic. And I think it can mentor a lot of individuals in the future too. Like hopefully we can bring that doc yeah. back. And it was huge. It was heartfelt. Again. You know, it definitely yeah. resonated. Well, we, like, might, you know. we, we, we might have some sort of follow up in the works. Oh, okay. you, you hear that? that? You heard it here first. I don't oh. walk around with a camera and headphones on <laughs> this for no reason. <laughs> there, there you go. go. There I you think go. that's uh, the beginnings of an exclusive. Huh? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So now you, um, 
talk to us about the experience when now they take you into a county, right? Because you went from there, you went to county. Yes. What was that like for you? It and, was, and, and still not sentenced or uh, no. you're still fighting your case once you get bound over? So meaning you were 18 already at that yes. point. So three years you fought your case basically? I fought three years, Whoa, yeah. Whoa, okay. Yeah. So I, I go to county with Jerry. We transferred Jerry and another, and another guy. We left together to county. And it was a reality check, man. Like I remember mm. like even Jerry said this in, in his, in his uh, podcast that we're not being baby no more. The truth, in the, the truth in a little room. And it was like, we were like so close to each other, right? And then they told us to get naked. Wow. And to strip down naked, right? And we like really close to people. You're mm-hmm. in a room full of people. That's and then, the butts, man. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and we looked at each other and we were like, nope, we ain't getting naked. Really? <laughs> right? So we were the only three that didn't get naked. <laughs> and then the sheriffs come and they talking shit. Right? Oh, and then they, they, like, they walk you through a hallway naked. You go through this like hallways just naked, man. Crazy. To the shower and then, you know, you get your stuff, right? So... It's very like, boom, like it hits you, right? Like very dehumanizing, you get the, the reality check and you get thrown in a dorm where you have no supervision. You like with all these like 90 people and then like all the prison, all the, all the jail politics, like you gotta learn fast. You kicks know? in, right? Yeah, it kicks in. So you're not a kid no more, this is not juvie, this is, this is how, this is ran, right? So we were together for a little bit, then we got separated and then we got together again. So it was very, um, like for me, it was more about like just trying to survive in a way, you know, trying to survive and, and, and don't get into trouble because anything can get you in trouble inside. And um, just learning, learning about what to do, what not to do. I, I definitely try still to go to church and so go to classes. I, I avoided a lot of problems as much as I could. You that know? early on in your journey, huh? Yeah. Right. Okay. So yeah. you, luckily, I mean, it sounds like you, you just constantly had these like... Uh, realizations where you're just like i need to do something or you were making those steps to yes. be able to right yes um at what point do you get sentenced in your in that time to your, your account when when did that come to a close i got sentenced on 2005 2014 okay. i got sentenced and you got busted what 11 what was the first 12 12 so i got so. sentenced towards the end of the 2014 I think December was when that the final they read me my, my sentencing and, and I, I took the deal because I, I, I took a deal for 15 years to life and um, yeah I got sentenced on December and January I left the prison yeah what, did they count the that time fast. that you were in the juvenile hall and all that to your sentencing or no did yes they count that? the credit yeah I got I got like almost three years credit yeah okay yeah. but it's still kind of hard to process that right like yeah. credit given the fact that you just got sentenced to life right. essentially 100%. right yeah. Um, did you understand what that was? Did you? What were you feeling with that when you you knew what you were signing up at that point? More or less. And I didn't know the the full extent because we had a lot of people telling us laws are changing. Like if yeah. you take this deal, you are gonna come home, right? So I was like hopeful. I am gonna come home. Like this only means that 15 years I get to come home, right? But I didn't understand that life meant life. Like Correct, that, man. that 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 15 after 15 years you start serving your life sentence your freedom is not guaranteed right because i when i went to prison i met guys that had seven years to life sentence they've been down 40 years right wow, yeah. so the number they give you in front of the life means nothing what what, what what matters is that you have a life sentence so i didn't understand that you know i was very hopeful and telling myself like oh i'm gonna take this i'm gonna do good and i'm gonna get out in 15 years or less right and um I remember today, I walked past CCV Court, Los Angeles Superior Court. Oh, this where was like CCV, huh? Yeah. The whole time. When I got sentenced, I took a selfie and I put it on Instagram because, <laughs> yeah, man, like I've been wanting to do that. I pass by there um, almost every day, right? And um, and I remember that I, when you see it in the in the documentary, I get sentenced and I walk out, right? And it still didn't really hit me. And then when I got in the county bus, and we hit that street. I remember just I had a window shot and I remember thinking about the people how freely they were just walking on the street right wow. and it dawned on me that it was going to be years before I can do that right that it was going to be I don't know how long and that's when I kind of felt like man what the hell did I just sign into yeah, <laughs> yeah. right man yeah that's a scary yeah thing. it is and I and I also brought it up because I remember that portion of the documentary where the lawyers like telling your mom and your sister um it's a deal like yeah. you know 
And and again, I, I'm luckily again, we're not saying that whatever. That's not again. Who's to say that's right or wrong or whatever? Mm -hmm. But the way he was painting it was like you know, and there's a chance that he'll get out in twelve max yeah. or something like that. Yes. I think was the number. Yes. And I'm like, just like I'm glad you touched on it though. Was like, that's not a certainty. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's. That's right. an indeterminate sentence. Yes. It could happen. It could vary. It could be 30 years, 40 years. Who's yeah. to say, you know? Yes. So now you're hearing from others, like, I've been here four years and I got 15 in life. So after that, did your mindset change from now you thought you could really make it up to 15 years to now it's like, I don't no, give a fuck question. at this point? Or what happened then? Yeah. So when I went to prison, you know, again, another reality check, you know, things get real. You know, like you you are in, we hit it, we hit, um, active prisons jerry by this time had already left so he had already started this mm -hmm. and when i when i hit reception it was uh, uh i was hit with that like i was asked for go to missions i was asked to do things and i'm like fuck man i just got here you know i'm just yeah. i just I, let me get settled man i just got mm -hmm. here right but it became real that i had a life sentence and the homies would tell me like hey man you're gonna do at least 25 years on your sentence so might as well go put in work, you know, go put in work and, and do what you have to do because you're going to be here a long time. Yeah. You know, so so I became um, hopeless. I became a little hopeless that it seemed like a long stretch. Even 12 years in prison seemed like a long stretch. I mean, stretch. it is. It is. Right? Uh, yeah, it sucks that we're... Time. We all we, we're using comparisons at this point. Yeah. When, when the next homie gets 30 to life and yeah. you get 15, it's like, fuck it, 15 is a deal. It's a steal. Yeah. I'll take yeah. it. But in reality, it's like, bro, you're losing 15. You can count them. You yeah. get tired of counting up to 15. You know, imagine that mm -hmm. much time lost. But more than that, what role are you going to play in the yard? You know, like, who, ah. who are you going to be known for in the yard? So this is uh, where, it be, for me, like, I have been doing well until then. I have been going to church, and that's when, like, I, re I, I, I decided that that was not going to be who I was going to be. I was not going to run Christian, right? So... I went through uh, some hurdles for that because now I have to be reinstated into the prison politics, right? So I made the decision that I was gonna do whatever they, whatever I had to do, right? Whatever I had to do to to survive this this journey, right? Yeah. So I hit Ironwood, and uh, and and I see Jared there, I see Daryl there. And Crazy, they, huh? Yeah, they're doing what their own thing. What was that like? Like yeah. seeing them again? Were you it like, was good. hey, what's up? What's yeah, up? it was it was good. But was the documentary out at that point? Or nah, still not? Yet. Okay. Wow. Yeah. This okay. Is no one knew you three guys. Right. Right. Those three guys, we don't know why they're so yeah. cool, but they're cool. <laughs> <Right>. Exactly. <laughs> it hadn't come out yet, so we, we chopped it up. Jerry was doing good, but then uh, he was um, he was definitely a different person than he was in the documentary. He had matured a lot. He, he was doing classes, and he was doing great for himself. Daryl, I think he was getting transferred. I only sat Daryl for like a month, maybe. He had mm. just got, he was going to get transferred to another prison. So um, didn't really get to talk to him a lot. But for me, that was the moment where, like like I said, I decided that I was going to be part of this life, you know, that I was going to do what I had to do. And um, when the time came for me to change, nobody can throw that on my face and be like, well, you haven't ever done anything, man. Because that's how it is. That was, that's how it was in prison. So... I was doing college classes and I was doing self-help, but I was just half-assing it. I yeah. was just ah. going to go, you know, trying to like stack the certificate, right? And I was just in the yard morning, afternoon, at night. I was in the yard with the gang. They, my, my former homies were there and it was a lot of, a lot of us at the time. So I was still in that element, you know, and I was just like willing to, to participate, you know? Yeah. And I remember I had this experience where like that they, they came where they asked me to do something, right? And I said, all right, I'll I, I do it, you know? And hey, I, 18, 19 years old at this right. point? 19. 19. 19. And, um, and I wrote Jerry a kite, and I sent it to him, and I said, my boy, I'm going to the shoe. And then, because we were going oh, to yard. Oh, man. Yeah, we were going to yard, so I'm like, yeah, I'm going to the shoe. And he's he got released to yard first, so he was waiting for me outside. And he said, hey, Juan, you don't got to do this, man. He's like, you, you, you don't have to do this. Shout out to Jerry. Bro. Yeah. For real, bro. <laughs> And I'm like, and I'm like, um, I gotta do it, man. You know, I gotta do this. And, and he's like, um, he's like, nobody's gonna look at you different if you decide that right. you wanna go a different direction, right? And I knew what he meant, but I was like, nah, I gotta do this, right? So I'm walking the yard, and um, and I'm gonna get my 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 directions, my instructions, or whatever, right? And I realized that that day was February 26, 2016, right? And that's my mom's birthday. 
I haven't even called my mom and say happy birthday, yeah. but I'm going to be a, put away in solitary for I don't know how long, right? And I just like, it was a, a reflective moment for me because I was like, man, I'm fucking stupid. You know, like, what am I doing? You know, like I had the internal struggle of like, I know that this is no longer who I want to be, but this is where I am and this is what I have to do yeah. to survive, which was immature, which I knew that now I know that I had different options. Correct. But at that, at, in those years, I still didn't see them, mm-hmm. you know. So um, thank God things didn't work out the way that they wanted them to work out. And I, I ended up not, not getting cut up in that, right? But it was a big learning experience for me because I realized that maybe I don't want to, but maybe I don't have to do this if I don't want to, right? So I started using, like, um, like I said, college and classes to, to keep myself away, to create distance from the game, right? I have to be at the yard yeah. and things like that. Okay. So, so that was my little beginning, right? And I would go to the groups and some things will start to sink in, you know? Some things were kind of like, Okay, that makes sense, you know, and, and and but I still wasn't really like into it. I would go every day to the yard and hang out with the homies at least for a few hours, right? Mm-hmm. And it got to this point, like in 2017, towards the end, actually, that's when I was like fed up, you know. There was a lot of other things that took took part in the yard that made me realize that man, this is not what I want to do, right? But I remember thinking that. I wanted to do better. I wanted to do something for myself, right? I already gave my life for the game. I'm already doing life in prison for the game. If I was to get my freedom, this that, that life would have, was going to be mine, right? And a big factor, yeah. a big factor for me was my my son, right? right? I remember that by this point, I had access to him, right? I remember the first time. So from juvie to Ironwood, I juvenile hall asylum like twice, three times, mm-hmm. then. County jail was to the glass. Uh, reception was to the glass. And the first time I saw him in prison and he ran to me, it broke my heart, man. It broke my heart because I felt like I don't deserve this, you know, mm-hmm. because I haven't been there for him, right? So I have this little this little kid that, you know, like I started thinking about like, man, like what am I gonna teach him? Like even the simple things of like, how am I gonna tell him to do his homework if I don't do my homework, if I cheat on my college test, right? right. How am I gonna like, even in the workouts, you know, like the prison workouts, and I would like get 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 pushed to work out hard. And when I'm like, I wanted to quit, I'd be like, man, I'm gonna tell your son to push his limits if you don't push your limits, right? So I would just keep going, right? And and all these things for me were were um what kind of like helped me to to start reflecting more into like who do I want to be, you know? And um, it was the the final thing came through a class a class that the ARC um, sent uh, life coach over there, life coaches over there, and, uh, and uh, Cesar Suniga and, and, and Jamel, I can't remember his last name, but they were facilitating the, those classes, right? And they gave us an assignment to write a remorse letter. So all these years, I haven't thought about what I have done to the point where like now I have to sit down and write this man a remorse letter. Even if he's not gonna read it, I have to reflect on this and put it on paper. And that experience um, was like very like like it broke me again, you know. Like it was like fuck, man. Like 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 I cannot continue to represent what what led me to take somebody's life, right? I cannot continue to promote this mm-hmm. because I know that it wasn't okay. I can, you know, in the gang in the gang culture, it's very much normal to be callous about it, to brag about it, to 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 even like make fun about it. And I couldn't do it anymore, you know? I couldn't be in a conversation where that is expected of me because I'm not happy with what I have done. So, like I said, I was creating distance from my former gang and they noticed that. So when they hit me up for it, I was like, it's now or never, you know? And I told them and I was like, well, I don't wanna be part of this no more, you know? And I made that decision right there that no matter what happened to me, that I was gonna keep pushing because nothing was gonna compare to the pain and suffering I caused so many people in my destructive lifestyle. Yeah. Then if I get stabbed or if I get beat up or whatever, right? Then I told myself like, even if I have to do a life in prison, I'm gonna choose how to live this life. And I made that decision on 2017, November 15. And from that point on, I went through hell in that yard, you know? I went through um, the immediate pushback from the game, 
the immediate emotional rejection, they calling you out of your name, they putting you down, they want to fight you, want to stab you, want to remove you, right? I have, I'm curious, was this lifers or just other dudes? Because most of the time, the dudes that are doing that are dudes that aren't that are there for a little bit of time because they don't have to live there. Exactly. When you're a lifer, you're yeah. living there. They're not pushing like that. They're not. <clears throat> people think that you're like uh, automatically. And I get it because it's a hood situation as yeah. opposed to a whole yard thing. But uh, just in general, you know, mm -hmm. like you get more apoyo, you get the backing from these dudes. They want you to do well. It's always a little the dudes that are in and out that. Yeah. Um, it, it, unfortunately, it was both. There was okay. a little bit of both in it. You know, not not everybody. Um, how can I say? You know, everybody felt the same. Excuse me. Not everybody gotcha. felt the same. But uh, definitely they were not opposed to me getting hurt. If, if, if the decision was made, you know? So <clears throat> that was um, that was very like shaky, you know? Cause I would come out to the yard every day and I didn't know if that was the day that was gonna get not stabbed, knowing, I was huh? gonna get removed, right? And, uh, um, but I would keep telling myself that like, I'm not going back, I'm not going back. You know, you have to keep pushing. So <clears throat> I, um, from December, I was there December and, and I left December, 2017 to March 2018, that's when I transferred to a level two facility. But I remember during those, those months that was very uh, stressful, I had a moment where I was walking the yard and I don't know if you guys seen that, well, you guys have seen the movie Spider-Man, right? Yeah. The second one, when he loses his powers and he embraces. And there's that song that plays like uh, raindrops can drop in my oh, head. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had that moment, man, I had that moment, really? right? I was walking the yard and I remember thinking like, damn, like, I feel the most normal I ever felt in my whole life in prison with a life sentence, right? And uh, because all this time I've been hiding behind a mask that this is, this is who I am. But for the first time, I have to figure out who Juan was, you know? So I'm figuring out who Juan is and I'm starting to think that I like this guy. I like who this guy is, right? So <clears throat> I'm going through this transition and I have these moments where like I feel empowered by this experience. Like, like nothing, like I said, nothing's gonna compare to what I, what, I, what I have done, so I'm gonna take it. And I have friends, man, I have great people that supported me. I had a great Sally, Marco, Marco Canchola, that he, he, he was like very uh, inspirational to me because he was, also, he was a year older than me and he was also going through the same thing. Mm. And, and, and um, to be able to feed off that energy, like, like people like your brother, right? Like there yeah. was a lot of people in Ironwood that thank God they were doing good, man. They were like, they were showing change in a GPR, in an active yard. This is, this can happen, right? So I feel like empowered and embraced by this community. And this is what like kept giving me the strength to, to do it, right? Yeah. And then I go to- And, and you know, I don't mean to interrupt, but I, mm -hmm. just to touch on that, the, the culture at that time in the very early stages before SB 260, SB 261 was, um, you're a lifer, you're a youngster, it's your turn, yeah. right? That was generally the, the, the idea, the canon of, yeah. of prison. Um, once those laws came about, or right up to it, luckily, they, uh, uh, CDC started putting more programs, started doing all kinds of things. The youngsters with these life sentences started doing everything they needed to do. Um, but again, it sucks that at that early stages, the, the, the idea was... You have to be the one to do everything because you just got here and you're young when these guys were doing the opposite. So you can see where I'm not saying it's frowned upon, but it was just it was a little rougher. Yeah. Right. And it wasn't until luckily shortly after these laws, uh, even Prop 57 and all that came about where it was a culture shift. It, they started being more comfortable with allowing youngsters to do this. And again, you were always allowed. I'm not, I'm not, you know, saying that, but mm -hmm. it was just a little harder for, again, we come in with figuring out who, who we are and mm -hmm. we have to battle with like, oh, I'm not tough because I go to college. Right. right. So it's a cold realization. Yeah. Um, so it's tough for the youngsters that did it in the early stages. Um, but then once they seen people go home from it, then everyone was like, holy Let me crap. Hop on this. Yeah. Me, yeah. So um, just to yes. touch on that culture shift that happened, and I and I think it was for a good thing because now, you know, yes. we have some of those programs you're talking right. about. And and another big thing that helped me out was that I didn't have to go to level four, you know, because of uh, the youth offender program, the jobs, they were letting us go to level threes, level threes facilities, right? So if I would have gone to a level four yard, 
I will probably be barely dropping down to level three or two right now. Yeah. You know, because over there the culture was completely different. Like yeah. over there it was very much enforced for you to do what you have to do. So so yes, 2015 through 17, like this was a culture shift because we started seeing people go home. I had a, a very good friend of mine, Vladimir too, that he he was arrested when he was 16, ended up doing 26 and he got found suitable. Uh uh, 2016 so that was like you will hear people go home lifers go home maybe like three out of the yard maybe right mm. everybody else was getting denied but that's those crazy. three was whole because before right. nobody was getting found suitable correct true. so that's when the numbers started coming then people like your brother like like raul started getting commuted 2017 right and this is something completely different right this is yeah. like, man like if you do good if you excel and, and, and put your face and your name out there that you are somebody that deserves to be commuted or, 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 or that should be allowed the opportunity to to come out again you're gonna get it right so that's when i was like man i'm gonna do it man filed the commutations didn't go that route you know it didn't happen but i filed them anyway you know because i was like i want to give it a shot so, so you were part of the ones that my brother that it was like 2016 he said it took a little while that yeah. everyone every all everyone shot out everyone yeah. that qualified yeah. shot it out and so basically you're petitioning the governor for uh it's not even like a resentencing or anything it's just having your sentence cut right there because you're found to be able to um so it's not even like a pardon it's nothing yeah. like that it's just mm -hmm. you know yeah basically uh you get to go home judged based on his decision because you've been rehabilitated yes. or okay. something right I, I filed one under um what was it brown and then newsom and i never got called unfortunately but i believe the reason why i never got called was because i didn't have that much time to go to board right uh -huh. my board date was closer uh -huh. than a okay. lot of other people how yeah. many years were you in on that one like by that time when you did the jerry brown sorry uh no not, let me see from 2012 to 18 so six years okay yeah oh so i can see okay yeah now when uh take us to the time now when you start kind of going through the motions of you know getting found suitable for for release yeah so uh i went to level two um and that's when i like the same way that I, and I'll say the same way in the, with the same passion that I have submerged myself into the gang, I submerged myself into change, you know? And that's yeah. when I began to like unravel my life, you know, nice. go through the trauma, like make sense of why I made the decisions that I made, uh, go to groups, um, go to college, right? And I began to be open, you know, sharing groups, because that's big, man. When you have to um, learn how to share your life, if you don't share it, with people like if you can have it all figured out in your mind but if you're not going up in the groups and speaking out then you're gonna be able to when the time comes right yeah so i began to to push myself to do those things right and uh and um i i did a lot of stuff a lot of groups man that 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 helped me to develop that insight and i and i went last year 2022 on july 14 i went to my first board i had 10 years and seven months in when I went on uh, 15 of life. And the reason why was because Prop 57 took away two years and it took some time off with mm. college and, and, and credits, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it was it was stressful, it, Boris is stressful. Yeah, because you have to sit in front of these commissioners and just be completely open, right? Yeah. And you second guess a lot, you know, like do I have the right insight that they want, right? You hear all kinds mm -hmm. of crazy stories, like this is what I answer and they, they they me on it like they, they they just told me that I was wrong or whatever right and uh, I remember thinking that worst case worst case scenario for me was gonna be a three-year denial and best case scenario I, I was gonna get found suitable right and I told myself well I'm gonna I'm gonna go for it like if I'm gonna go go found suitable you know I'm gonna push for it to the best of my abilities mm -hmm. because what's the point of not you know I want to go home right? yeah what's the alternative not yeah. do it and just stay there I mean yeah. you yeah. gotta at least try yeah exactly. So I did all the work. I took pride in my packet. I wrote everything down. Um, there was a lot of people. Was a couple of people that helped me. My lawyers, Susan Harbour and Alice Newman, they were great, man. Great people. Nice. Yeah, they gave me um, the opportunity to prepare myself, and and they were there supporting me in the room, you know, in the in the, wow. in, the in the board. And this is after COVID. We still were in, um, having to wear masks. This is through video, right? Mm -hmm. But they still there by my side, supporting me emotionally and everything. And um, it was a hell of an experience, man. Um, I had uh, Commissioner Chappelle, who's supposed to be uh, one of the 
more like rougher commissioners. Mm -hmm. I think only 10% of, of the guys that went with him got found suitable on 2022. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. And I was in that 10%. And uh, the pre commissioner decide. And they were fair, man. Like, I, 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 I cannot say that they walked me through it or anything like that. That I can say that they were fair, you know, that the questions were point blank. Everything that they asked me, I, I, I felt I was ready to answer because I have done the work, you know. That there is a lot of work that goes into preparing yourself for the board. So I did the work, and I was, uh, I was okay with being open. I told them my life story. And I feel like they, they understood, you know. They understood, like, the same way that maybe talking to you guys, it can make sense to you, to you guys why I kind of went that direction. I felt the same kind of, like, understanding from them. Yeah. You know? And they found me suitable. They found me suitable that day. First shot, huh? Found First shot. Suitable. What, I, one thing that is crazy, because we did avoid the, or we did kind of jump over this, but you were also in the idea is, upon release, if you, if successful, you get deported. Yes. So that's another thing that you're thinking. Yeah, that was in the documentary. The whole, the whole part. Yes. So assuming you go through this and you get you get found suitable, you're under the impression, all right, I'm going back to back home. Yes. Like home, home. Yes. Right. Oh, so, so oh, really? You had you already had it where like they're not gonna let me out right here to to L.A. They're gonna deport me. Yes. You had wow. that those thoughts at that yeah. point. So in my mind, I was okay with it. If um, if they deport me because I understood, of course, what I have done and mm -hmm. I have forfeited my right to be here, so I was okay with it. But there was another, like, the political climate in my country right now is very, Correct. it's different than when right. I left. So I had that fear and concern in my mind, right? Because, like, I'm happy I got found suitable, but I got to go and be, maybe be in prison in my country now, right? Yeah. So, and torture and kill or whatever, right? So this is the, my fear. So I was happy, but I wasn't happy, right? If things would have been different, I would have left because I told my family, I'm not going to allow you guys to spend money that you, that you don't have and lawyers and, and bonds, you know, and, and for me to come home. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to I'm going to make it wherever I go. You know, I'm going to be successful wherever I go because that's my determination now. Right. So that was my mind. And I had a whole little plan that I wanted to do when I when I got over there. But all that went out the window um, for the recent things that are happening in my country. Mm -hmm. Right. So now I became more of like, now I got my freedom, but now I gotta fight for my life. You know, That's crazy. Yeah. So yeah. two big ba battles, man. Yeah. yeah. So I couldn't be happy. You know, I didn't, I didn't cry of joy when I got found suitable. I didn't cry after. You know, I didn't even feel happy telling my my family, hey, I, I got found suitable because I'm gonna get picked up by ICE. You know, and sure enough, I got picked up by ICE, and I had to go to the um, immigration detention center mm -hmm. in Adelanto six and a half months. So you you even had to do more time now with yeah. there. Yeah. What is that like there? I like I've never had like known yeah, like is that, what that is experience that a, is like. Man. It's it's different than prison for sure. Uh -huh. And they treat you better in a way mm -hmm. uh, and um there is no politics and stuff like that. But you have that 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 constant like fear. Like if you fear going to your country, if you have like very substantial like threats over there like you're not happy, man, because you're stressful. You know, you yeah. you go in front of the judge, and, and it's hard to prove that your life is in danger. There's a lot of requirements to prove. It's not just like you say it, and okay, you can stay here and become a resident or whatever. Right. Right? There's a lot of paperwork. If you don't have a lawyer, it's, it's brutal, man. Like you're, if you're underrepresented there, then you're not gonna get to stay. You know. So I got blessed um, to have um, another person, another lawyer represent me, right? And um, her name is. Um, what did I, what, I blacked out, sorry. Oh, good. No, oh, you're good. good. You don't even but, have to but say this, name, she, sorry. She, yeah. So the, she, she's the one that, like, you knew she had your best interest, and you, you knew she this was going somewhere, like you guys had some action? Yes, yes. Okay. So, so And I wanted to say her name because her and Susan and Alice, they represented me for free because of the documentary, because they saw my story, because they knew that um, what yeah, I was facing, fantastic. right? So it's... Uh, um, I can't remember her name right now, but um, that was a big thing for me where like I feel like, yes, I'm going through these things, but I'm not alone. I'm not completely alone, right? So that was um, empowering as well that I have to face this, but I wasn't alone, you know? So I'm going through all this, and the, the system there works where you get opportunity to get bailed out after six months. You have to make it to six months, and after that, they consider it inhumane, inhumane for you to be in custody because the case can take years you know right. so, so you're not serving time you're not you're not locked up like you're not arrested you're detained 
So they gotta give him a shot to get to to post to post bond. And I go to that hearing, and it was brutal, man, because you have the guy that the equivalent of the DA, the Attorney General, using anything and everything against me, right? Even the documentary. He even brought no me, way. Yeah. So you felt like he knew who you were beforehand, and he right. was out. He was he, out for you, or he did his homework. He did his homework. Oh yeah. man. What? He even used Antonio in the in the hearing. He used exactly. Antonio's example that. He, this this kid like got out and he went back to the same thing, you know. He oh that is man, that's a cold wild. way to paint a picture, man. Yeah, yeah, but but he neglected, of course, Jared. That he got out and he's doing amazingly, right? So of course he neglects that he part. He didn't bring him, he didn't him bring up at him. all. Wow. But but I feel like man, like they're gonna probably deny me bond, you know. But the thing that helped me, um, uh, the many things that helped me was that I had a lot of support. A lot of people show up with support letters, you know, mm -hmm. and um, I, have, I have been clean this whole time. So what do you have to prove that I'm a danger to society if right. you only have behaviors that I did at 16 years old, right? Mm -hmm. So under the law, it doesn't prove that I'm going to reoffend, um, that I'm a, I'm a constant danger because I haven't reoffend in so long, right? So they couldn't prove that I'm a risk to society or I'm a flight risk because I, where else would I go? You know, I have yeah, correct. I have my family here. You know, uh, uh, everybody that supports me, and um, yeah, so they got me. Uh, they got me bond, and thank you for the people that helped me too, because a lot of people donated and they go fund me for me, because it was a twenty thousand dollar bill. Mm. You know, and we didn't have the money for that, so it was a lot of people and organizations, um, Freedom for Immigrants, that help help me post that bond. You know, shout and, out to them, man. For real, yeah, real. Man. Yeah, they're doing good work. My my wife, my sister did a lot of work in that too. I know that Ben also helped out. You know, Scott. They, everybody. I feel like I said I didn't feel alone because there was a lot of people behind me, pushing for me to come home. You know. Did Did you feel the shift of uh, when you're doing the right thing? You see how much support comes out. Yes, yes. Has to be a good feeling, right? Yes, because people trust you. You know, people start mm -hmm. trusting you, and and they start. But they believe in you. I think like a lot of people believed in me since the beginning, but it took me believing in myself. Man, yeah. you know, part. So, so that was a, um, it was beautiful to to have that, you know, because in the beginning I just didn't like, I didn't have the strength to stand on my own two feet, you know. I still was, I still care about what other people thought of me. I still care what other people say, you know, and I wanted to, I wanted to be tough, you know. I, th I thought that that's who I have to be, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have these people that believe in you and that and that show you this like unconditional support that I didn't thought I, des I didn't think I deserve, you know? And it's almost like I owe it to all these people, right? I owe it to my family, like faithfully there with me all these years, you know? And, and all these great friends that I had met along the way, right? There was a lot of people that I met along the way that I never thought I would have friendships like this, right? Because when you go in, you know, like, and I, and I, and I said that you feel hopeless, right? Having a life sentence, I didn't even think I was gonna kiss a girl again, you know, because right. this is like it's done, man. You, lifers didn't have family visits when I got when I went to prison, you know. So what can I offer a girl, you know? Right. Just hold your hand and visit, you know. Maybe yeah. give you a little pig here and there, right? Yeah. And, so, and, and I bet at that time no one can write a letter as good as you. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> For real. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's an art. It's a lost Put art. The game, and, yeah. Yeah. It's unfortunate prisoners have. Penmanship to the max. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. Last I start. Can see that. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So so that was the the that that's what like I'm 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 happy. I'm happy that, that I have these friendships Absolutely. and these connections, you know. Because even now I got an out and like reconnected with all these people, you know, go and have lunch with them and it's like, man, it's good to finally see you out here on the other side, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So oh go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. no, no, I was just um shit, yeah, yeah. Well whatever. I was just gonna ask do you feel like you got people watching you at this point or expectations from like, you know, outside forces, which would be friends, family, the people that you're interacting with? Everybody's pretty much like very understanding that it's, it's, it's not as easy to readapt yourself. You know, mm -hmm. it's only been like a month. Since I've been, since Man, I've been that out, is. Right? Wow. So they understand that it's going to take me a while. I don't think they, is, they expect they like pushing me, mm -hmm. but they want they want me to do good, like they want the best, the best for me, right? And they have that expectation that they see greatness in me, right? So, so they they tell me like whatever you do, I know that you're gonna you're gonna do great, right? So it feels like reassuring for me, you know, to have that, That's have those dope. relationships that, that build amazing. you up, yeah. So when you got released today, because I, I don't know if the camera scene has solved, but you have a monitor on now, right? Yes, yeah, an ankle monitor for eyes. So did they put that on as soon as you got released that day? Yes. 
before it got sent out. They yeah, they put it in the cells over there in immigration. Yeah. So when you were getting out, what happened after that? You went. So you had your family here already. You went straight to the family, um, and now you're with them, pretty much doing your thing until yeah. you as you're going on with this case. Yeah, yeah. So I went to see my family first. My wife picked me up. We went to uh, to my sister's house. I spent that weekend man, just doing regular stuff in the mm -hmm. house. Went to the park, you know, saw my son, played soccer with my son, you know, and everything. Oh my God, what yeah. was that? So you like? saw your son. Okay, yeah. how did yeah. that happen? Was how great. was that interaction? First time great. in a while. Right. And... So I didn't tell him I was getting released. I surprised him. You're yeah. crazy. Yeah. Oh, heck no. You're crazy. He was old enough to like comprehend all that at that point? How old well, was he? Well, he's 11 now. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah, so okay. He, he's yeah. definitely aware of everything. Yeah. And, and I didn't say it for two reasons, right? Because one, I, I felt that he was going to get impatient if I told him like, like, I didn't tell him I was found suitable. I didn't tell him I was in immigration. I was just telling him that I was getting transferred, right? But he didn't know I was coming home. Crazy. Or they have the possibility of coming home. Because I didn't, if something didn't go right, and I wasn't back, then I just told him I'm coming home, and now I'm telling you, you know what? Let him down. Never mind, right? Mm -hmm. So I didn't say that for that reason. And it was almost like repeating the story. Because when I met my dad, I was four years old when I met my dad. But I met him like that. Just one day, boom, he walked into the house you know, into the, into the neighborhood. And he's like, hey, that's your dad, you know? So, so it was almost like repeating the story with him. Oh, man. And they, they had him in the house, right, in the living room. And they told him, hey, we got a surprise for you. And they, they gave him a poster, right, that says, welcome home, we miss you. But he didn't know what it says, right? So he just holding it like this. And I walk into the, into the house, and I just see him, and I call his name, Kevin, right? Mm -hmm. And he doesn't even want to, like, <laughs> no. he's just froze, right? He just yep. froze. Oh my and, God. I, and and I hugged him, man, you know, and, and, and you know, he didn't want to cry, you know, like he wanted to hold it in, but I can tell he, you know, he went to his room and cried a little bit, you know, because he was so overwhelmed, up. yeah. Eyes all red and like, yeah, it's just <laughs> yeah, but but it was amazing, it was great, man, you know, to, to finally see, um, to tell my mom, be like, you know, like, mom, I'm home, you know, I made it home, you know, mm -hmm. and, and my sister too, you know, and, and being in the presence with them, my wife, my lawyer went there too, she went to pick me up too. You know, so that was a good thing. We ate pupusas. They long. It was nice. a, a, almost 12 years wait from that day that <laughs> yeah. I got arrested. Yeah, but we finally ate pupusas, you know. And uh, um, that because that's what I crave, you know. Like, I'm not big on food as it is, but, like, I wanted some homemade food, you know. Yeah. I wanted some, some something from my homeland and something that was made by my mother, you know. So my mother's a great cook, and she made those pupusas, and I was like, man, like, this is home, you know. Yeah. Yo, one thing I want to highlight that is, like, a really big picture, but... I mean, is that you still have this family after? Yeah. Because you didn't burn these bridges. You didn't. Say, you didn't say fuck you. You didn't say any of that because you still kept it. Yeah. You knew that they were actually having a, a just because of your actions. Yeah. Not that your actions. They're adjusting for you. Like no, they have to adjust to you. Yeah. Um, and I think that's one thing I highlight because family is so important. Those people that even nowadays that we push away or we we disrespect, you don't realize when you're gonna need them the most. Yes. Um, and you don't understand that they have that crazy unconditional love for you that they'll still be there. But if you keep yeah. pushing and pushing and pushing, you won't have those opportunities anymore. You're going to have to start on your own. Yeah. And you were mature enough to understand that and, and, and still try to support your son, try to support everybody, yeah. um, even though you knew your situation. Yeah. And I'm thankful for them. You know, I'm thankful for my, for my family that, that didn't give up on me because it would have been different if they gave up on me. Because, like, I wouldn't have the hopelessness of prison. And then, like, hey, nobody cares. So who cares? You know, like, right. I have that, 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 that mentality. But I realized, like, I didn't start putting myself in their shoes until I read an article that my sister wrote. You know, because she was, uh, she was um, doing um, writing classes for IOW too, and she oh, wrote an nice. article where she she said that what it was like to be a translator for my case when I was going to court because my mom didn't speak English, right? So she was right. the one that was Crazy. translating my mother and it didn't dawn on me like I, until that moment i was like man i'm sorry i'm sorry to my sister mm -hmm. you know? i never put myself in her shoes and, and and think like man you are i was 16 she was 11 when i put her through all this right so she had to mature a lot faster she had to be um you know a lot more responsible than than any 11 year old has to be right and and my mother man my, we, we have put my mother to a lot you know and it's painful because I have seen the transition in, in, in her attitude and her body and her face, right? That it takes a toll, you know? Mm -hmm. It does take a toll. So so that made me want to reconnect with them, ask for forgiveness, ask, apologize to them, and, and just be 
just be a good son and a good brother and a good father. You know, any chance that I can have to see them in the visiting rooms, through phone calls, through letters, right? I will, I will try to be that for them, you know. At least, at, at the very least, listen. Because if I have nothing else to say, I'm just gonna listen, you know. And and um, yeah, so now like it's it's a blessing, you know, it's a blessing. One percent. Now what? Like I love it. I love it. You're doing it now, slowly but surely. Yeah. You're gonna be. I mean, there's so much. Like, there's a lot of expectations, but there's so much. Like we believe in you, right? Yeah. Like we really believe in you. So like, tell us a little bit about. I'm um, not specifics, but what are you doing now? Slowly, like integrating back now, right? Yes. What's that look like for you right now? So, so for for me right now is just trying to find my footing. You know, like I'm doing a little part time job, trying to get involved with these organizations that I can like create change, right? So like, people recognize us for the documentary, they feel like they can identify with us, and and I feel like this is a big opportunity for me to to use this voice that I, that I have and and take it to somebody that they can do something with it, right? Or, or inspire a kid because I was inspired by people like me when I was in juvenile hall. I remember Scott Bundy bringing random people and they telling us these stories, right? And maybe I didn't look like the most interested in the in the unit, but there was one thing that stuck, right? And and I kept that through my whole time, right? This gave me strength. This gave me like some sense of direction. So I would love to do that for somebody else, right? Because I had had letters like of people that write me, right? People that asked me to to write their brothers, like I had a, I had a lady that that in West Virginia that asked me to write her brother, and that he was kind of like messing up, and and he was like, man, he identified with you in the documentary. It'll be it'll mean a lot. It will it will mean a lot for me if you write him. And I wrote him, man. I wrote him letters, and I was trying to like give him something good, you know. I don't, I hope he he did well at the end. I don't know what happened at the end, right? But those are the things that I know the power of words, like like role models. We talked about early role models, like. What would it been for me to have a role model, right? So if I can be that for somebody, I would love to, you know? Oh yeah, man, you're doing it now, right, right off the bat in front of a camera. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. beautiful, man. We appreciate you opening up today, and we appreciate you being an open book more than anything, yeah. you know, allowing us to ask any questions. Um, and I'm excited, because hey, just a heads up, you know, I'm going to the camps too, um, Camp Afroball, Camp Rocky, some of you guys maybe uh, may know what's up, but. I mean, I'm gonna try. To, I'm gonna try to get you out there to speak to yeah. some of these kids too. Yeah. Um, your voice is, your voice would do a lot. Thank you. It's gonna do a lot, a lot going forward. Yeah, yeah, agreed. And I know we chopped it up uh, prior to the podcast, so we're gonna have your email. You said you wanted your email, and we'll put yes. that in the description mm -hmm. if you guys want to reach out um, for whatever, right? If they yes. want to give you merch, if they want to maybe bring you on another podcast, one hundred percent, right? Whatever, we'll have the email in the description. But uh, thank you, Juan, man. Thank you. It was a crazy episode. Good to see you when right. we walked through the door. Yeah. Okay. I was like, this is a guy. There's no way that's <laughs> yeah, not him. Yeah, you know what I mean? You're looking the same. A little Absolutely. more facial. That's all. <laughs> yeah. But uh, shit, appreciate you for coming through, showing us love. Yeah. Reentry Network Podcast. We out, baby. Let's go. Hey, wait, wait, hold on. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, and all that, guys. Yeah, yeah, Come yeah, on yeah. now. Oh, yeah. Give the love. Come you on. have to. All right, y'all. We're out. Thank yep. you.